All right, so I want to move to translation then. So it's fascinating to me again. There, there's two major points of distinction between what do I call it? Because this is no longer even the heartland versus Mesoamerican, no. right? This is yeah, that's a separate like, thing entirely. Uh, academia versus heartland. Still, you know, it's 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 like this this divide that happens. Interestingly, um, and and the, the second flashpoint on this is the translation of the Book of Mormon, and it comes down to the idea of the Urim and Thummim and the seer stone. And and so I think what happens on the heartland side is they're saying, wait a minute here, academia is opening things up here and, and trying to bring in the idea of early 19th century magic into the, into the equation here. And they're saying they're not going to have any of it and that none of that happened and et cetera. Um, and so then it comes down to the instruments of the Urim and Thummim <laughs> and the seer stone. First question for you is, do, does, is there anything from Joseph Smith or Oliver Cowdery directly referring to using the seer stone as an instrument of translation? Not that I'm aware of. That, uh, all of the ev evidence that I know of comes from somebody else. Okay, so they're mostly second, third hat account accounts. Yeah. On. Now there is there is an inference that would come from Joseph and Oliver, and that is at the end of translation, Joseph handed Oliver the chocolate colored seer stone and gave it to him as a memento, and all, it was in Oliver's family for a long time before it was given to the church in Salt Lake. So now you back up and you say, well, why would Joseph Smith give Oliver? the seer stone at the end of the translation of the Book of Mormon, if that seer stone had never had any interaction with the translation process. Mm -hmm. So it's the only one that I know of, and it's certainly after the fact. It's certainly not definitive, but it raises the question of why in the world would he do that if the seer stone had never been used in the translation? What do you make of the idea of folk magic in the time and culture of Joseph Smith? Uh, it was certainly there. Uh, it was fading and fading fast. If you go back another hundred years or so to England, it was prevalent. Um, you know, in an age, in an age where they probably were more su superstitious than scientific uh, those kind of people were around all the time. Uh, they were the, the cunning men and the cunning women, and they were respected in their communities. What was happening, however, is separate from the way the community was working. There was now a more elite population that was going to universities, and they did not believe those same things. And so there was a divide that was beginning prior to Joseph Smith's time. Well, they come over to uh, New England and you bring those divisions with you. And the more rural folk settling in the more rural upstate New York continue these, these practices. And we call them magic. Um, magic, a pejorative term. The anthropologists are not terribly fond of it because of the, um, the implications. Uh, it was a way of, it, it was their science. They, they considered it as a science. And what happened is in early New England times, you had in the more rural places, the continuation of this, you know, archaic science coming from England, bringing all of its traditions with it, and they show up almost in the same way. And then you have academia that's saying, yeah, that's not a good thing to do. We don't like that. Well, obviously, academia won out, and we don't like that. And we really don't like anything that has to do with what we perceive to be magic, seer stones, and anything else. So if you look at what happened you know, in history, in the Latter-day Saint history, uh, that starts to get erased pretty quickly. The, the more saints that are joining 
from coming from other locations that are not necessarily part of the rural populations, they're not as comfortable with sear stones. And so early on, the sear stone becomes the Urim and Thummim. And Urim and Thummim, because it shows up in the Bible, that sounds good. We can do a Urim and Thummim. Yeah, and that sounds way better than, than uh, the sear stone. The problem, of course, is Urim and Thummim was never in the New World. Never. Urim wait, wait, wait. Thummim. The Urim and Thummim was never in New York? No, heavens no. No, the Urim and Thummim is an old world instrument that uh, that went out of fashion um, she probably before even Lehi's leaving the old world. Wait, wait, uh, wait, 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 wait. Okay, so, so what yeah. about what about the description of the breast the breastplate and the two stones coming, you know, that were held for Oh, that's, that's a, not the Urim and Thummim? That's the problem. That's the problem. They have become named the Urim and Thummim because they were given that name. Um, I had seen the information that it happened in 1833 with W.W. W. Phelps. Uh, I recently heard Blake Osler say that he found an article from 1832 that talked about the Urim and Thummim. Um, but this was a name that was borrowed from the Bible and then applied to uh, the instruments that Joseph Smith had. Now, what were the instruments that Joseph Smith had? What were they called? before somebody decided to call them the Urim and Thummim, which, by the way, wasn't Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith doesn't use that terminology again until later when everybody else has adopted it. It's, it's another one like Kimura, where it's being put back in. It's not contemporaneous. So if you go to the Book of Mormon, the, the Book of Mormon has two descriptions for what these things are. One, they're called the interpreters, which is their function. They're to interpret language. The other thing they're called is two stones. Okay, now if Joseph Smith is going to translate with two stones, I don't have a problem with him translating with one stone. And apparently he took the spectacles apart and used one of them because they hurt his eyes. Um, and so he tried with one of them, eventually replaced it with another. They were too wide, right? Yeah. So, but 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 then the, the the problem here I think comes from the sourcing of these things. One, the chocolate sear stone comes from the ground there in New York. Yeah, sure. Right. The 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 two stones, yeah. what is later called the Urim and Thummim, is something that is provided by an angel. So yeah. So you've and, got uh, these sources. And, and Mosiah why... had one. Where did Mosiah's come from? Well, I have my own theory on that, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's real simple. It, there are Maya shaman these days. I mean, modern days, there are Maya shaman that use stones to uh, interpret uh, the, the will of God. Mm -hmm. um, and they use all kinds of different things. Uh, one of them has some practice stones that uh, are marbles. Uh, but usually it's some unusual thing that they find in nature. Uh, it's a natural thing that doesn't look natural, um, or sometimes it's created. So John D., who is the sort of astrologer for, I think, the first Queen Elizabeth, uh, is using a seer stone. And one of the things that he uses is a concave obsidian mirror, uh, mm -hmm. and obsidian is reflected. Um, in the history of the world, this, this is where these things come from. Uh, you find a, a rock that doesn't look like it should be natural. And if it doesn't look like it natural, that means that it isn't. It's, you know, something special, uh, which is why the, the, one of the types of seer stones that you see uh, were actually Indian gorgets. And they're kind of a, a rectangular piece of thin rock that will have two holes drilled through it. And the people who found them had no idea what they were, but they really didn't look natural, and so this would be a seer stone. Um, so, yeah, throughout so, ages, throughout history, that's where these things have come from. Why does Joseph Smith need to use the chocolate seer stone if he's already got these two other stones? I mean, I probably gonna remove, to. Why, why not just remove them from the breastplate and use them both or use one of them instead of yeah, the, apparently the seer did. stone? Yeah, apparently he did for a while. Uh, why he changed? You know, who, who knows? You'd have to ask him, and he never said. Um, but, you know, the other evidence that we have from Emma, and then again, 
anecdotally from him handing this seer stone uh, to Oliver is that's the one that appears to have been used most often. Is that a problem? Uh, why is one stone different from another stone? I don't care if you call it a Urim and Thummim. I don't care what you're a, or a, you know, what do they call them? They're called lightning stones. Um, so I can't remember exactly what the name is, but regardless of what name you put on them, it's a rock. Yeah, and, and, and here's the thing. I think that the, the issue that some in the Heartland camp have is that it somehow ties Joseph to magic. And and whereas again the sourcing of the Urim and Thummim that we call the Urim and Thummim at least is yeah. is divine for sure, and and this idea that okay where there's a seer stone involved that brings it into the folk magic realm and that's hurting testimonies and yeah. you know that that's not a place that we need to go. I don't have a problem with it, but <laughs> well and and but some uh, people professional certainly seem to have a problem don't. with it. Yeah, professional historians don't. But obviously, a lot of people do, which is why it was written out of the histories and why you will get uh, Joseph F. Smith and Francis Kirkham saying, no, they would never have used a seer stone. You get adamant statements that they didn't use a seer stone from people who weren't there and didn't even get secondhand. I mean, this is long after, but adamantly saying no. Well, why? Because you want to separate it from folk magic because you're kind of embarrassed about folk magic. You know, we don't want Joseph to have been the village seer, uh, even though we have really good information that he was. Well, one thing I forgot to ask Jonathan about, I, was, I should have brought it up, was going back to Doctrine and Covenant 6. And, you know, the original, the original uh, language in the Book of Commandments on that, it's verse 10, is, Behold, thou hast a rod. Yeah. And blessed art thou because of thy gift. You know, and, and, and now it's just all gift. They put in gift instead. So it seems somehow that somehow a rod, whether, again, what does that mean? Is it actually a rod or is it actually thinking about, maybe it's yeah. a, another word for a gift. I, I don't know. Historically, we know. I mean, historically, we know that Oliver used a rod as a divination tool. Mm -hmm. uh, and he wasn't the only one. That lots of people did. Uh, apparently, Joseph Smith had a at least a few attempts um, at what well, we would call water witching. Mm -hmm. um, his father did. We've got, you know, this is historical information. And again, not surprising because it continues to this day. There are other people who do this. This isn't shocking. Uh, it's just uncomfortable for many people. So we try to, you know, whitewash it. Um, but it was a rod. And there, I think that becomes important because we're talking about uh, Oliver trying to translate and he's to, Oliver's told that he could translate. And Joseph says, yeah, you can translate. Go, go do this. And there's every reason to believe that he's going to translate. And then he doesn't. And so the question is, why not? And then we get that explanation that you have to think it out in your mind. And, and we love that because that works for us. But there's absolutely no indication that that's how Joseph translated. Joseph translated that there's no indication he's ever thinking about anything. He is repeating a phrase. And he'll wait till they say it back. And then he, there's no time to say, okay, wait a second. I've got to figure this out. I've never seen this character. Be there's never any of that. And that's because what Joseph is doing in translating has something to do with seeing a text. Exactly how that happens. We all have to get argue, you know, argue about how that might happen. But Joseph saw something. He used his eyes. There's all kinds of evidence for that. Well, I get even then, though, Brent, you could go beyond that and say it has more to do with his mind than it would with his eyes. Even I mean, we don't know what that's what that really is. He is he actually seeing the words on the stone, or is he seeing it in his mind? Is it, it maybe he is thinking it out a little? Maybe he's going through this. Maybe there's a mental yeah, and spiritual process um, that is not purely just physical. That's where everything gets squirrely, and I have a hypothesis about how that happened, and I put it in my Gift and Power book. Uh, it certainly has not been universally accepted, um, but I think there is a reasonable explanation for where the language comes from and why he's seeing it, and it does have to do with the mind uh, and the ability to, to see text, you know, see in the mind, and frankly has a lot to do with how seer stones work because Joseph isn't the only one who ever used one. Um, 
you know, we have people who've used them, who describe what happens and how do you use them. And then there are people in the modern world that use them. Uh, and frankly, one of the things that you do with a sear stone uh, is you find some way to cover your head so that light can't get in there, um, which is why he puts it in the hat. You know, you don't put it in the hat because, you know, you didn't know what else to do. You put it in the hat because you needed to put it over your face and make it dark. Um, you know, that's how they work. Uh, other ways of using these things, the Romans used to use a sword and the sun glinting off of the sword. Uh, in fact, Joseph didn't always use the hat. There's the 1828 account of the uh, marshals that went to, to get him and they said, you know, we, we're going to test you to see if you're, you really do see. Um, and so he took up a seer stone and held it against a candle which means if you think about it, he's looking at a stone and the aurora around it, he's getting blinded by the aurora and he's only got the stone in the middle. He can't see. Uh, and so he has them open up a book and he read the page to them and they were unimpressed. They said, yeah, we just, we knew how he did it. That's, that's not a, but they described it. And so Joseph wasn't just using it in the hat. He would use it against the light. Um, the three young girls in Salem were using uh, egg white dropped into water because it obscures things. And you would look through that and you would use that as a method to, to see who your future husband was going to be. And they got caught and made up other stories to save their skin and didn't save a bunch of other women. Uh, but yeah, historically throughout the history of the world, people have done this. We know what they do. Uh, and what it does is it requires that you obscure vision. So you still see something, but you see something when everybody knows you can't see. And that's how you know that this person has the second sight. Scottish second sight is one of the things it was called. It's because you see when you can't see. Well, the mind is seeing something, and that's how you know that it works. Uh, Andrew Lang was an anthropologist who got curious about this, and he got himself a crystal ball and handed it to a number of people. And he said, yeah, most people, they look in it and they couldn't see anything. So, but a fair number of people would look in it and they would see something and describe it. And the one that was most important for me is he handed this to a young girl who saw a piece of paper with writing on it that was so real to her, she turned the crystal ball over to see the paper on the other side. So here we have somebody using a crystal ball, a seer stone to see writing. Well, that tells me that Joseph could have done it. That's interesting. What does translation mean? Mm -hmm. uh, Samuel Brown has probably the best indication of, of what Joseph really meant when he said translation, which was not translation of words, but translation of worlds where he was translating words, he was translating worlds of God and relationships to God into concepts that man could understand. And I think that's beautiful and probably the most accurate and not useful for this discussion. Um, for this discussion, what you are doing when you are translating is taking meaning in one language and attempting to produce that meaning in another language. Now, you'll notice that I said meaning. Uh, there, I don't know of anybody who is fluent in two languages that ever goes through a word-for-word -word translation. Those of us who have tried to learn another language and translate something, yeah, we do the word-for-word -word thing, and then we go, okay, now I've got the words down. Let me see if I can make sense from them. Um, I did this when I was trying to learn Nahuatl. Uh, and I never became fluent at it. I'm still a word for word. I've got to translate it. And then I've got to look at it and say, okay, well, how would I make that sound something in English? Um, so it's the meaning that we're translating, not the words. And I think that's evident in the way the Book of Mormon um, results in a language and many metaphors and idioms that are related to the 19th century rather than the time period of the, you know, when the Nephites wrote those plates, wrote them the, the information. Okay. All right. Anything else on translation here that you wanted to get in? Yeah. I can't think of it. Okay. I want to move to a couple of 
uh, textual things from the Book of Mormon that that I have an interest in. First of all, I want to talk about Abinadi and what's happening there with him and King Noah and the priests. Um, I, I've seen there. There's and now I should have had this information available, but I yeah, I've my seen a lot of commentary on Abinadi and King Noah and what's going down there. And a lot of that commentary focuses on the idea of, you know, he obviously Abinadi is bringing in Isaiah. He goes through, you know, first the Ten Commandments. He brings in the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. But he really focuses in, the issue comes up with the priests of Isaiah 52, 7 to 10. This is where Abinadi gets into the most amount of trouble. And the commentary on this is typically something to the effect of this is a nationalistic uh, uh, group of verses here that's talking about the people of God, so to speak. And it, for Israel, it's Israel. And for Noah and his priest, it's it's their land in the land of Nephi. And they can't be wrong, and they're they're righteous in their minds, and and it, which is probably all true. But the whole focus of Abinadi's sermon to them has to do with looking using the law of Moses, looking forward to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. When you read later in Mosiah with the death of Abinadi. Many people come to the conclusion that he's killed because he's telling them to repent and tell, calling out their sins. But that doesn't really have anything to do with Isaiah 52, 7 to 10, which is what the, the priests come back at him with. Um, if you go back to Limhi, and I say back to Limhi because He's later going to tell, they later we get the story of Abinadi from him, but Limhi back in Mosiah 7 says specifically that they killed Abinadi because he was preaching that Jesus Christ, talking about the image of God, would come down and be born into mortality, that God would basically take on flesh, and that's why they killed him. Why do we get all this commentary talking more about this nationalistic issue? I, I'm thinking, you know, Joseph Spencer writes about this, and and it's been written about in Mormon tradition all the way back to, uh, I think it's Reynolds, not George, the other Reynolds back in the late nineteenth, uh, yeah, late nineteenth century, who's adopting biblical scholarship on Isaiah fifty two seven to ten about this being kind of this nationalistic. Uh, uh, what, what do I say? Na nationalistic uh, verses here. Why is the commentary, even the know why from Book of Mormon Central says the same thing? There's nothing about they killed him because he was prophesying about Jesus Christ. Why yeah. do we get this? Where am I wrong here? <laughs> well, first of all, you're not wrong. Uh, secondly, it's the old story of the blind scholars looking at the elephant and each one grabs a different part and has a different perspective. And I think what ties them all together to make them an elephant is realizing that in the ancient world, there's no division between religion and politics. These are all the same thing. And particularly with, you know, in France, even in uh, Zarahemla, uh, up to the time that you get Alma coming out of the land of Defi and going into Zarahemla, um, everybody's the same religion. You may be uncomfortable with it, but there's only one religion. This is how you are. And the religion supports the politics. And this is the way Israel was. Everybody's the same religion that supports the politics. So religion and politics are not separate. So knowing that, go through the story sort of piece by piece. Start off with the Isaiah passage. The question there isn't so much what does that mean, but why was it brought up as a question? So why did they think that they would trip up Abinadi by saying this? Well, that's where the national politics come in, because from the perspective of the people asking the question, 
they're saying, we're doing pretty well. This is pretty good. We are this people. And, you know, why are you saying anything against that? So they're expecting him to do something that contradicts that. Uh, so that's why the question is asked. Everything about all this politics, you know, that is the right meaning. And it's the reason why the question is asked. It's not the reason why Abinadi answers the way he does and not the way things end up. So why does Abinadi change it? Well, because he's coming from God, who's told them to give him a message. Then basically he's coming down and saying, you got the wrong God. You know, your definition of God is wrong. God is the one who is going to come down. And uh, that's, um, I mean, revolutionary, not so much in new, but as in separation. You know, this is a, a way to disrupt politics. You're saying the king is wrong because he's got the wrong God. If he's got the wrong God, he has no right to rule. You know, this is somebody who is coming in and he is threatening to divide the people. And so that threat to divide the people by teaching that there is a God that is not the one uh, that the king has, you know, that's going to divide the people. That's going to cause separation. That's going to cause problems. And so, of course, you're going to kill the guy because you don't want him fomenting you know, revolution, uh, you know, in your nation. So he's killed because of that, but because of the, the political ramifications of that. Very much the way Christ is killed politically, not religiously, but there's a religious reason behind it's it. It's political, but even with Christ, it's the same thing. He, I mean, you go back and you look at the Gospel of John, which is written, you know, probably after the other Gospels, and he's coming back. And one of the primary reasons he writes the Gospel of John is to, he says specifically, to show that Jesus is the Son of God, which is a title talking about the condescension of God. That's what that title means. And in my mind, anyway, that's that's what the title is. And they kill him then for blasphemy, right? That's I mean, it's, 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 he's, it's blasphemous. Yeah. So the Romans don't do it for blasphemy, but the Jews want him killed, and they feel right to do that because of blasphemy. Sure. I it, To me, in my mind, it, it sees the exact same thing yeah. with Abinadi. It's blasphemy. Yeah. Yeah, it's the same thing. It, it's the same thing. That's that's what he's going to be accused of. And the reason you're going to accuse him of blaspheme, whether you believe that or not, and of course they did, but um, punishment for blasphemy is death. Yes. So, yeah, if you say he's guilty of blasphemy, of course you can kill him. That's what the law says. It's interesting, isn't it, that Noah, being the son of Zenith, who comes out of Zarahemla, with a God and, prefer, you know, a, a, a teaching of Jesus Christ, who's going to be coming down in the meridian of time, then f they fall away from this, obviously, into a different, a different theology. A, a different version of it, and it's a version of it that we see popping up again in Zarahemla um, that may have, have, you know, Melekite origins, uh, because we see it with anything that's called the order of the Nehors, whether it's Nehor, um, uh, Korahor, you know, any of those. Um, if you look at the tenets of those, one of the very, very first things that they will say is that they are anti-Christ. Uh, so there is this segment of the population that is, they are basically Christ deniers. And so, yeah, we will believe in the, the law of Moses, because, you know, we live, that, we live that and that's fine, but we're going to deny Christ. Well, who are they denying? We're denying that Christ is the God who's going to come down. That whole aspect of what's going to happen in the future, don't believe that. Uh, and, you know, so that is a sub part of uh, the land of Zarahemla, even prior to the time that these other people leave and go back. Uh, so I think they they took those ideas with them, and it was much more comfortable to sort of believe those um, you know, when they got further away. Brian, it seems to me, and I've done this, I'm actually giving a talk on this soon, but it's one thing I think we miss in the Book of Mormon is the story of all the dissenters. And we kind of look at that, this dichotomy of the Lamanites and the Nephites, and it's them against the others. and But we get this, we lose what's really happening to me, what's really happening in the Book of Mormon, which is the break-off, the dissenters from the Nephites 
whether we talk about it, and these may all be different people or not, but we got the Amlicites, the Amalekites, the Amalekiahites, the Zoramites, King Noah, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the Kingmen, you know, you, you go on and on with all these different groups. There's something that's fascinating that happens with all of them. They all become Lamanites. Now, in your, th- your terminology, you're saying, well, that's just the others. I don't know if that's true or not. I would suggest that <laughs> they're part of a theological group that is saying, we don't believe in Christ. We don't, the, 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 the loss of Christ seems to happen every time one of those groups moves on. And they all become, they're all religious. They all still have their synagogues. They all still have their churches. They may be like different sects within the Lamanites, but they all become these Lamanites and they're allied with the Lamanites. And to me, there seems to be a, a, this allyship is shared to some degree with a, a, a theocracy that is, that is not centered on Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Sure. Oh, yeah. Most of the work that I've been doing over the last, I don't know, five, six years, seven or eight, um, I'm looking more at the writing of the Book of Mormon, you know, the process, you know, what, what's the mental thing that's going through uh, the minds of the writers. And of course, when you get to Mormon, he's the one that's pulling all these stories together. You know, is, is he doing this because this is the only thing he finds when he goes through the large plates. This, this is the history. And I think his purposes and the way he writes tells us that that is absolutely not true. He's telling us what he wants to tell us and that there's a message. And it's this is one mind that's doing that. The other thing that I think is fascinating is that it's a very, very different mind than Nephi. I think the loss of the 116 plates did us a disservice in that we have the information that we need to start the history with the small plates. You know, we get that history that we lost. We have a different mind setting up proposals and we read that first and that dictates through the end of the Book of Mormon when it shouldn't because Mormon wrote it, not Nephi. So to, to clarify what I'm saying there, Nephi is the one who comes up with Nephites and Lamanites, and he separates them, and the Lamanites become the enemy. And he has to do this because he's creating a new people. There is an old world tradition of how you create the narrative of how you make a new people. He fits with a lot of that. Um, And one of them is you need to define yourself against somebody. You need to have an enemy. Well, the Lamanites become the enemy. And so all throughout the small plates, it's the enemy, it's the Lamanites. The Lamanites are coming, they're terrible. When you get to what Mormon does, if you look at the worst wars that are being caused, who is behind them? Well, Lamanites are fighting them, but the people who foment them that make sure that the fighting happened are those apostate Nephites that you're talking about. Yes. And Mormon is making a point that the really, really bad people aren't Lamanites, they're apostate Nephites mm-hmm. that make bad things happen. And he writes them all somewhat similarly. So they all get very Nehorite sounding uh, religion. Um, Several people, and the one that I learned it from was Mark Wright, who was looking at the MLK, uh, the kingship uh, from Hebrew. I'm going to talk to you off the record on this. Okay. I disagree with it, but go ahead. (laughs) Yeah, but I mean, it shows up again, as you said, the Amlicites, Amalekites, everything else. And shows up in the kingmen. Uh, this is a way Mormons using to say, yeah, who are the people that are antagonistic to the Nephite way of life? Well, the, the people who want a king and the people who are antichrist. And they're not antichrist in the Bible sense of antichrist. Yes. They are against Christ. Exactly. Uh, and they're denying Christ. But those are the people who go to the Lamanites, become Lamanites, and foment the trouble and create the problem. Uh, And until you get the introduction of the Gadiant and robbers, it is the Nephite apostate-fueled Lamanites that are the worst bad guys. So Mormon's bad guys are very different from Nephi's bad guys. It's a very, very different message. And Mormon goes out of his way to say that if you convert a Lamanite, 
like the anti-Nephi Lehi's, like the ones that produced Samuel the Lamanite, they're better than Nephites. Yes. That's Mormon's message. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. And it's 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 more about, again, the traditions of their fathers. It, it's not they have the knowledge and they're fighting against it. It's it's more about the traditions of their fathers, which is a completely different thing. Brad, we could talk for hours. I wish we could. Probably. But we're going to end this, and we'll probably have you back and talk a few more, a little bit more about some of these other topics with the Book of Mormon. Thanks so much for Thank coming you. on the show, and we'll have you on again. Thank you.